Shalom and welcome to Jerusalem Studio. Even before this week's announcement by the International Criminal Court prosecutor regarding charges against Israeli officials, there were differences in opinions and policies between the U.S. administration and European governments and institutions. Despite occasional tensions between Washington and Jerusalem, the American support for Israel has been much more solid than the one shown by both the European Union and individual capitals. How wide is this gap and can it be bridged? To help us gain some information and insights, we're joined by two distinguished professors from the Netherlands, Professor Uri Rosenthal, former Minister of Foreign Affairs of the Kingdom of the Netherlands. It's good to see you, sir. Thank you for having me. Also joining us from the United States is Professor Russell Berman, who is the director of the Middle East Project at the Hoover Institute at Stanford University, who formerly served as senior advisor to the foreign planning staff at the U.S. State Department. It's good to see you as well, sir. Good to see you. The pleasure is all ours. Uh, and with me in the studio, of course, TV7's editor-at-large, Mr. Amir Owen. Amir, take it away. So developments are so fast here that uh, last week's uh, story uh, sounds um, so obsolete as if it happened years ago. Last week's story being the uh, hold on one arms shipment from the United States to Israel. Now, if you take that and this week's uh, announcement by the prosecutor as case studies, you see that there could hardly be a European equivalent to the arms shipment uh, pause because the United States is Israel's major arms supplier. And of course, there can be minor cases of arms being bought by Israel, purchased in European countries, and then because of uh, some government action or uh, some uh, union uh, stoppage, uh, the arms will not get to Israel. But Israel, of course, relies on American support. So if there is even one small dent in this support, it makes headlines. And almost the same goes for the ICC. Um, the United States is not a state party to the uh, ICC. There are some 124 state parties. By the way, the state of Palestine, which doesn't even exist, is one. And this, um, as we have seen in the um, uh, charges which the prosecutor uh, has threatened to file, this gave him the opportunity to say that the alleged crimes were perpetrated in the state of Palestine. This is a very strange way to construct it, that Gaza is the state of Palestine or part thereof, and therefore, and so on and so forth. So the United States, of course, has immediately condemned what the prosecutor, who happens to be neither European <coughs> nor American, um, laid out. And in Europe, there is some division of opinion. Some European governments uh, already said that they will not follow up, even though they are supposedly committed to, um, to, um, to the ICC, while others are yet to announce their policy because they want the institution of the ICC, as well as the ICJ, uh, to be upheld. They want the Putins of the world to still be under threat, while they don't want the leaders of democratic countries to suffer the same fate. So there you have it, the difference between the United States and the not united states of Europe. Indeed. Well, let's uh, turn to Professor Berman. Uh, I, I'd like to hear your perspective on this, and I'm very keen on, on understanding uh, from an American perspective, how is this regarded? Also, of course, within context, uh, that uh, the United States, as Israel, is not a signatory of the Rome Statute. Well, to um, with the exception of the far left, like Bernie Sanders, across the political spectrum, there's been rejection of the the the, the prosecutor's request to 
um, pursue um, arrest warrants. Uh, the United States is not a signatory to this. The Trump administration was more adamantly opposed to it. Biden administration walked that back a bit. But nonetheless, with regard to this particular issue, there's widespread rejection. Now, if you turn to, to Europe, uh, as has already been mentioned, there's a, a range of opinions. The UK and Italy are the two countries that I've seen have rejected it already. Perhaps there are others. Uh, Europe is a uh, diverse continent with many different countries, all with different national interests, no matter how they may pretend to be part of one European Union. And they have uh, different uh, relations in the Middle East. Uh, what is... Um, I suppose disconcerting if one zooms way out uh, is that um, it's clear that the uh, the court decision is going to be a political decision. This is not about justice. This is about politics. And the effect of that will be to further erode the credibility of this institution, international organization, just as other international organizations are losing their credibility. I say that without glee. It's too bad that the United Nations is undermining its own um, capacity to act as a uh, force for peace in the world. But we're seeing a weakening of international in organizations across the board. Professor Rosenthal, how do you regard it? Uh, you're obviously currently located not too far away from uh, <laughs> the lovely city of Den Haag. I must say it's one of my favorite cities in the whole world. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, the beautiful palace is occupied by some less beautiful characters that uh, tend to make uh, mockery of uh, international law and as such of the rules-based order, uh, utilizing it uh, in a cynical way uh, for political reasons, as Professor Berman justifiably said. Well, let, let me say that um, the main... Um, that one of the main points actually with this uh, prosecutor's request for a uh, arrest warrant, uh, the main point which is uh, really uh, going right to our hearts also here in the Netherlands is this perverse impression of equivalence between the democratic state of Israel on the one hand and the terrorist gang of uh, Hamas. Let me say that uh, in uh, straightforward terms and words. Now, you see that also in the uh, reactions to this uh, prosecutor's request, um, and I i am not that optimistic, actually. Uh, there's When you talk about US and Europe, it's only the U.S. which unequivocally um, distanciates itself, dissociates itself from this whole thing. While in Europe, countries like Czechia, Austria and Germany are indeed focusing highly on this, what I call, perverse impression of equivalence between Israel on the one hand and uh, Hamas on the other. Uh, so... Um, I have not seen one of the European countries up till now which says that it simply will not accept the um, uh, role of the ICC in this, uh, in this uh, matter. Now, of course, we here see, uh, as a more basic point, the divided Europe. And there we go, uh, from the southern uh, European end, especially Spain, for instance, and also France, Macron, uh, and of course also a country like, which is, uh, which is very heavily anti-Israel throughout recent history, Ireland, they all uh, cheer about this prosecutor's request. While on the other hand, countries like Germany, the Netherlands, Germany, Czechia, and Austria are on the other side. Uh, with regard to my country, the Netherlands, which is hosting, that is the way we are phrasing it, hosting the ICC, uh, the Dutch government, although it is uh, more or less among the, uh, um, among the alliance here in, in Europe, 
with Germany and a bit the UK to do as much as possible in uh, favor of the state of Israel. The Netherlands takes a purely neutral position here because it doesn't want to intermingle in the ICC uh, affairs. That's the situation we have. And meanwhile, in the context of a uh, persistent anti-Israel mood, which is uh, uh, which is uh, waving through Europe, mixed with a anti-Semitic surge, uh, so the picture is rather bleak. I should say I can't make more out of it than that. Uh, with that being said, and that is something that I'm hearing in multiple European capitals, Mr. Oren, is that more and more uh, nations identify that the points of pressure emanate from totalitarian regimes beyond the scope of democracies, which are seeking to infuse democratic societies with disinformation, with all various activities that ultimately aim at fostering a certain favorable foreign policy from those various democratic nations in regard to their own foreign policies. And therefore, my question is, to what degree can something be done to frustrate those totalitarian regimes from being able to influence foreign policy, not only in Europe, by the way, also in the United mm. States, Australia, and elsewhere? The bigger problem for, for Israel, um, which does not necessarily emanate from this latest issue, but it is uh, being reflected by it, is that Israel has been pushed into a defensive diplomatically. And even if it manages to win this defensive, it has only so much political capital in Europe or ab abroad in general that it will not have enough to go on the offensive. And Israel is always asking the European Union or bilaterally the various capitals to, uh, uh, for instance, uh, put Hamas or other organizations on the terrorist list. And there are various uh, initiatives uh, in this regard throughout uh, the years. But now Israel must firstly take care of itself in order to avoid being charged and by the way, we have not seen sanctions here against Israel as a state. The arrest warrants asked by the prosecutors are against two Israeli officials. And he has left room here. Obviously, the three judges might, for instance, take out the uh, arrest warrant um, against Defense Minister Gallant as well as the Hamas political leader Hania, and make do with the arrest warrants against Netanyahu, as well as against the two arch terrorists, uh, Sinwar and Def. So this would be a sort of a, a compromise they, they will have. But by the time this is over, and obviously this is not really uh, an act against Netanyahu, he will not take the chance of going abroad, even if... Uh, a it's certain, an act against Israel, let's put it No, no, but that, even it's an injunction against Netanyahu going abroad. Nobody is going to send um, a squad to arrest him in Israel. But, but nevertheless, by the time Israel expands its political capital, fighting this, it will not have enough to pursue its enemies. Well, I, I think that the, the main issue here, and this is, you know, you hear Western societies and governments to, always talking about the rules-based order and the importance of this structure. Ultimately, when uh, the International Criminal Court in The Hague, which is supposedly the criminal court of the United Nations, uh, supposed to bring about a certain structure to the rules that have been established under various UN resolutions and UN Security Council resolutions, uh, when this court does not follow the letter of the law the way it should be, uh, naturally, uh, it raises many questions, not only about the attacks from countries like Russia, China, and others, the Islamic Republic of Iran, for that matter, against this rules-based order, but also uh, the institutions that's themselves that have been infiltrated by 
non-democratic individuals. Uh, we need to take it as it is. But uh, let's uh, turn to uh, Professor Berman, since there was a letter that was published before the decision by the prosecutor to uh, ask the court for those uh, various arrest orders pre-trial, that is, uh, including Senator Tom Cotton, uh, signing it, Senator Bill Haggerty, and, and a long list of other senators as well, who basically threatened uh, the prosecutor and the court itself with dire consequences, sanctions, and other ramifications if he would follow through on what he actually did. Are we expected to see some sort of follow-up on this pledge to hold the court and its prosecutor accountable and launching uh, uh, sanctions regime that will uh, liken what was the case also in the past? That specifically is a political question in the United States. As I said before, there's widespread rejection of the prosecutor's request. Whether the Biden administration would act on these sanctions is uh, another matter. Surely if there's a change of administration in the, in the United States, uh, the ICC can't uh, expect any kind of uh, warm and fuzzy um, uh, relationship from from Washington. But I want to uh, revert for a moment just to the point that was made earlier. Uh, yes, the court could drop the um, uh, you know, one charge on the Israeli side and a charge on the, um, on, the, on the Hamas side. But frankly, what the court should do is drop both the Israeli charges because Israel has a robust judicial system that is capable of handling these kinds of accusations. Um, maybe precisely because the judicial reform didn't go through. That's a separate issue. But the judicial reform did not go through, so there's no doubt that the Israeli court system could handle this. There is no court system on the Hamas side, and that's why the court should proceed against Sinwar and Dave, but not against the Israelis. With that being said, according to Article 2, subsection, uh, excuse me, Article 4, subsection 2, uh, it still needs to receive the approval or written agreement from Israel in order to go after Hamas. It has not received that, not vis-a-vis -vis Hamas and not vis-a-vis -vis Israel. So in both cases, it must drop it. And unless the prosecutor delivers according to the rule of law and the uh, various clauses that are very draconian, uh, of the Rome Statute, uh, I personally expect that uh, this should not go through irrespective of the merit to go after Hamas, don't you? But in that case, who speaks well, for the that, civilian skills? In that skills? case, you have a rogue prosecutor like we have in Brooklyn uh, in, uh, with, with the Trump trial. Uh, you have, a, you have a, a prosecutor who is not even obeying the rules of the game for the respective court. Indeed, and that's the issue or the core of the issue. But let's uh, turn to the broader scheme of things. To what degree, Professor Rosenthal, do we see a certain collaboration between the various capitals on adopting a certain cohesive foreign policy versus Israel, versus the Middle East, versus the Islamic Republic of Iran and other uh, issues related to the Middle East in Europe in alignment with the current administration in Washington, for instance, as we can uh, identify when talking about the so-called Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, which was an alignment of sorts between the various governments. Well, uh, 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 allow me to, to make one remark on these intricacies you are uh, talking about with regard to the ICC. A lot is now in the hands of the legal expert in the ICC, Andrew Cayley, a UK uh, uh, highly esteemed legal expert. And uh, rumors have it in any case that he is quite uh, even handed in his approach to this whole uh, prosecutor's request. That having been said, your question, uh, Jonathan, actually, let me let me uh, let me um, emphasize that we are uh, about a few weeks from the elections of European Parliament, and the change of the European Commission's composition, as well as, of course, um, and uh, there we expect a change to the right in the European Parliament. And we already foresee that, uh, for instance, certain high offices in the European Union will uh, be uh, in the, will 
be put into the hands of uh, countries which are perhaps a little bit more on the Israeli side. For instance, this uh, uh, present high representative uh, for foreign policy, Joseph Borrell, who is definitely by has an anti-Israel bias, will probably be replaced by a guy or girl from the eastern part of Europe, especially from the Baltic countries. So there is something to uh, to see forward to. Uh, at the same time, Europe uh, remains divided as it is. But when you talk about the US and the EU, imagine that the uh, presidential elections in uh, the United States in November would be won by, for instance, by uh, Donald Trump. And on the European side, there would be a little bit more right, uh, right decline, right, um, uh, right of center, wave. Yeah. Then, then the situation might change. I would say. And especially when it's about a nuclear deal, I would say that uh, the uh, overall sympathy of the European Union with regard to this nuclear deal may be uh, also a little bit more uh, disputed than it was before. Indeed. Well, uh, with that, I'd like to encourage all of our viewers, uh, go out and vote. Make sure that you hold your representatives or those candidates who you uh, seek that they will become your representatives are held accountable and know quite well that they need to contend with concrete issues uh, related to Europe as well as to Israel. uh, Since, uh, in my opinion, the current uh, high representative for foreign policy and security related matters, uh, Josep Borrell, uh, is not only anti-Israel, from my perspective, he's anti-Europe. Uh, the way he's been acting for the last several years. But that's, of course, my perspective. Uh, Mr. Owen, we don't have very much time. When we're talking about the broader picture of things, can European and American foreign policy vis-a-vis the Middle East be adjusted uh, in a manner that would not only benefit Israel uh, from a certain uh, point of view, but also benefit those countries who have been complacent Uh, Let's face it, complacent not only about developments in Africa, which has been abandoned for so many years, uh, has been abandoned in Central Asia, where the influence of the United States and uh, European Union has, or European nations, has evaporated. Uh, The Pacific, we're seeing Australia basically standing on its own, uh, let alone uh, New Zealand, in contending with rising challenges. Uh, But thankfully, there are certain elements that are being uh, enforced and uh, hopefully the next administration in Washington and the next governments in Europe will be held accountable to contend with those challenges at hand. So, of course, um, this uh, ties into your earlier point. Um, And if the trend which both you and Professor Rosenthal uh, have described and uh, Professor Berman uh, too, uh, if that is true, all the more reason for Josep Borrell and others to rush into judgment now before they are ousted along with their outlook. So if that is true, uh, Israel should be concerned about uh, the immediate range rather than uh, uh, be um, uh, more complacent because down the road things uh, may change. Now, There's one word which was not mentioned here, and that is Ukraine, because this is the top priority for both American and European policymakers, and Israel, um, as well as other issues, uh, take a backseat to it. So if there can be uh, a meeting of the minds between Washington and Brussels, Washington and the major European capitals, on Ukraine, This will also reflect on their ability to get to some uh, middle point on Israel, Gaza, and Middle East uh, issues, Iran included, too. Two sentences each. Professor Berman, we'll start with you. 
uh, as the historian Timothy Snyder recently put it, we're at 1938. Um, our adversaries, Russia, China, uh, Iran, uh, and North Korea, want to push back against the West very, very vigorously, and the West is confused and weak. It's important that the West find, a, find its political compass and push back. Professor Rosenthal? We are here at the heart of the matter. Russia, China, not the least Iran, the threats from that end, you know, we should understand that what is happening in the Middle East, the Gaza war, is directly linked to the threats of, from Russia, China, Iran, is directly linked to what is happening in Ukraine. And that should be, that should, they, there should be an increasing awareness in Europe about this simple fact. Mr. Owen? Well, the, the error, the tragic error of Brexit uh, caused uh, such a, a disruption in the um, uh, trend towards a more federal Europe that uh, Europeans and uh, Britons, uh, of course, should regret it. But it will take a long time for Europe to get its act together and then to ally itself uh, back with the United States. As uh, Winston Churchill opposed British accession <laughs> into the European Union, so will I stand by the Brexit and say that it was the best thing that happened to England. And hopefully, uh, Germany and France can come to terms and reach a certain conclusion of reforming the European Union to once become a functioning institution. But this is all the time that we have for today. I'd like to thank Professor Berman, Professor Rosenthal, and Mr. Owen uh, for your insights today. And I'd like to thank all of you at home as well. Until our next update from here in Jerusalem. Shalom. <laughs>